So, after your first calculus course, you know everything you always wanted to know about functions of one variable. Today I want to take you into higher dimensions. As it is, mathematicians like to walk around in higher spheres. Functions of one variable model situations where one output variable is completely determined by one input variable. In real life, however, the value of a quantity you are interested in is seldom the unique result of only one other quantity. For instance, the time Daphne Schipper sets on a 100 meter race is not simply a function of the amount of carbohydrates she has taken during the 24 hours prior to the race. It depends on many other factors, like the different kind of training she did, the hours of sleep she got during the previous week, her actual weight, etc. etc. So, unfortunately for you, we will not analyze Daphne. For the time being, she is a much too complicated model. For an example of a function of four variables that might be more manageable, consider the temperature T in the atmosphere above Holland during one week. Then T is a function of the position and of the time, where the position can be modeled using three space variables x, y, z. So we write T of x, y, z and T. Questions regarding T you will be able to solve after the second calculus course are, at a given moment in time, what is the average temperature and at which location is the temperature maximal? Or, at a given moment and a given location, is the increasing or decreasing in time? And, in which direction in space is the increase the highest? In this video, I will answer none of these questions yet. Instead, I will have a look at how the graph can still be a useful object for functions of more than one variable. For functions of one variable, say y equals fx, the graph is a great help. Note that it consists of all the points x, f of x, where x is in the domain of f. From a picture of the graph, you can, up to some accuracy, find where f takes on certain values, for instance, the value 0. You can also see where the function is increasing and decreasing, and, again, within some accuracy, read off what are the locations of the extremes. Let's go one dimension up and look at functions of two variables. Now the input, so to speak, consists of two numbers x and y, and the output is a number z. We will write this as z equals f of x and y. The graph now consists of all points x, y, f of x and y, where x, y are the points in the domain of f. To construct it, we need an x-axis and a y-axis for the input variables, and a third axis, say a z-axis, for the function values. The picture shows one point of a graph, which is now a point in three-dimensional space. Together, these points form a surface in three-dimensional space, for instance, as in the right picture on the slide. Except for very simple functions, it is generally not easy to draw a picture of a graph with pen and paper. However, computer programs like Mathematica or Maple bring them to life beautifully. Moreover, I have a young colleague, Dennis, who is really a wizard in this area. I'll give one simple and one slightly more complicated example. For the first example, let f be defined by f of x and y equals the square root of 4 minus x squared minus y squared. First, f is only defined if the expression under the square root is non-negative. And this is the case if x squared plus y squared is less than or equal to 4. This means that the point x, y lies in the circular disk of radius 2 around the origin. Next, note that the point x, y, z lies on the graph of f only if z equals the square root of blah blah. blah This means that z, z must be non-negative, and if you square, you'll find that x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals 4. This is the equation of a sphere. Since z has to be non-negative, the graph is the part of this sphere in and above the xy plane. You could say it is the upper hemisphere. Once we know this, we can sort of sketch the graph. I tried it by hand, and my second attempt led to this result. 
The graph is the green part. You may judge I'm not a very gifted artist, and I agree with that. I told you about, about Dennis, didn't I? It's him who produced this smooth picture of the graph. In the second concrete example, the function g is defined by g of x and y equals x squared minus y squared. It looks quite as simple as the first example, maybe even simpler, since there's no square root. But the graph of this function asks for sketching skills that I do not possess. First, let's zoom in to the behavior of this function for points x, y close to the point 0, 0, also known as the origin. It's an interesting kind of behavior, namely, look what happens. When y equals 0, that is, if you look at the function values in points x, 0, g of x and 0 equals x squared. The corresponding points on the graph are the points x, 0, x squared, x squared, and they lie on a parabola in the x, z plane with a minimum value of 0 at the origin. Likewise, for x equal to 0, on the y-axis, g becomes g of 0 and y, and this equals minus y squared. This obviously takes on the maximum value of 0 for y equal to 0. The graph shows the two parabolas. So with respect to x, f takes on a minimum, and with respect to y, f takes on a maximum at the point 0, 0. There's a name for behavior like this. The corresponding point of the graph is called a saddle point, and it's one of the topics which will come back later during the course. Well, now we have analyzed the function above the two coordinate axes, and I didn't, but I could have drawn this by hand. However, how to sketch the entire graph, which contains the two parabolas just mentioned? That's quite a challenge. I can describe the graph in words. If you keep x constant, x equal to a, then as a function of y we get g of a and y equals a squared minus y squared. This gives again a parabola with maximum value a squared for y equal to zero. So then the whole graph consists of parabolas parallel to the yz plane with maximum values for y equal to zero. In fact, these maximum values themselves lie on, a, on the parabola z equals x squared in the xz plane a parabola with lowest point at the origin. Luckily, there's Dennis again, and see what he produced, the wizard. The picture on the left shows the graph for x between minus 2 and 0. The blue curve is the parabola z equals x squared, where the maxima of the other parabola lie. In the right picture, the part where x is between 0 and 2 is added. Nice picture, no? Enough for today. See you in class.